And I got literally cooked alive. So just now I was thinking I, I have to put move the shielding closer so I'm I'm better protected otherwise I'm actually gonna throw up from my headache. But I'm like, right, that's it, we're doing this because it is about these psychopaths. Right, right. About that system. I'm so sorry. I'm I'm fine now because I, what is very, very interesting is that essentially they just sabotaged all my preparations and what they do, it's very interesting. I've got a measuring device and they seem to just pump the house with a very high frequency but just one peak and either i'm reacting to it or i've got some implants or nanoparticles but literally when that that frequency comes on my head feels like it's just exploding it feels literally just like it's a headache i never had in before in my life and when they crank up the power you know i'm literally just physically sick from the pain it's it's insane hello and welcome everybody today i've got paul marker with me who um, has over 30 years experience in organizational psychology in fact he defined the entire area of organizational psychology. And what we're going today is we are going to explain the, the fundamental problem with pyramid organizations. And if you just think about any organization, most organizations are organized like that, like a pyramid. You have the staff at the bottom, maybe coordinators and middle managers, and then senior managers at the top, and then the boss who leads the company. Now, the problem that we are going to discuss today is that these organizations work fine as long as they are fairly harmonious and it really looks like that. However, as soon as you have one psychopath who's recruited into the organization, these are people who essentially don't have any empathy, they're driven by power, um, and they like to control others. As soon as this person enters an organization, their major predominant drive is to rise to ever higher power. The problem is, as soon as they get promoted, what they will do is color the entire um, atmosphere, the culture of the organization. And it becomes very, very, um, well, they would say efficient, but in fact, very psychopathic. In a total lack of empathy um, will just define this organization. As this person climbs higher and higher, they will essentially assert ever more power and imprint their personal um, characteristics on sometimes large fractions of the organization here. In most organizations, it's impossible for one psychopath to entirely capture the entire organization with their philosophy. However, they can imprint it on, on many, many people. And usually you end up with a domain that looks entirely captured with a very toxic atmosphere. And then occasionally there are people still trapped in such an organization who don't agree with it, but they don't really, they don't have anywhere to go. The problem we're going to talk about today is that as an organization grows, a well, every organization is dynamic. So as an organization just evolves, these psychopaths tend to go higher and higher and higher. So bit by bit, there are going to be new people who enter um, and they will be normal in that sense. However, as all the psychopaths from the different branches climb higher and higher, we will end up with a top that is depending on how large the organization is. And very, very, very large organizations will end up with a top that is almost entirely psychopathic or is typically shaped by a very toxic and psychopathic culture. So what we're talking about today is that essentially, because of this effect of the tapering and because of the psychopaths who occur naturally in any um, population, and I think, uh, I think up to 1% of the population is said to be psychopathic, in very large organizations you will end up with a top that is almost entirely psychopathic and therefore you can talk about these pyramid organizations to be psychopath magnets at the top. So today we're discussing the problem of psychopath magnets, and I'll now pass, pass it on to Paul Marco, who will explain to us what to do about that. Hi. Oh, hi. My name is Paul Marco, and give, let me give you a little background on, on who I am and how I got here. And I think I can explain why my perspective is going to be a little bit different than you've heard before. And I will say that Catherine has a real optimistic viewpoint on this pyramidal organization. I've been in it for a long time and I see it as something much more dark than that. Let me tell you a little bit about myself. I started out with two degrees in education and I was in public schools 
and I wanted to be a principal because I thought I could help better then. So I went back and I got myself credentials in public management. Well, I couldn't become an assistant principal because I was working right outside of Washington, D.C. in a black school, and they needed more black assistant principals, and I was still not, I was still not black back then. So I found myself a job in the private sector. And it started off in training and development, but it worked into organizational development, which I'll explain to you a little bit later. Gives me kind of a, kind of a background. Uh, when I presented myself to the public sector, they saw credentials in management and two degrees in education, so I immediately became an educator in the private sector. Okay, so I'm working mostly uh, as a behavioral psychologist because that's the only type of psychology that the courts will allow in the pyramid organization. It can't be anything more esoteric than behavioral psychology. You have to be able to see it, measure it, or you can't take it into court. Now certainly, I did more sophisticated stuff than that later on, but mostly it's behavioral psychology. Now I wanted to get a PhD in psychology, but I wasn't interested in brain psychology. I wasn't interested in organizational development since I grew up in it. I knew that where am I going to go to get more information than I have. Uh, so I did a great degree in a, a PhD in consciousness studies. And subsequently I did work in measuring the expansion of consciousness. There is such a thing as the expansion of consciousness. It can be measured. Uh, Matter of fact, I put together a book with other colleagues called The Post-Conventional Personality. I think it's still available. It was published in 2011. And uh, it talks about consciousness and consciousness, measuring consciousness. Later on in my second book, um, Belief Magic, there's this chapter two has a little bit on consciousness, but it's really not about consciousness type. So here I am. 30 years experience in organizations. And here's some organizations I worked with. Department of Defense, Army Corps of Engineers, Canadian Air Command, General Electric Aerospace, Novartis Pharmaceuticals, Ryder, Ryder Truck Rentals, United Technologies, Brown Whitney, Sikorsky Helicopter, Otis Elevator, Carrier Air Conditioning, Steel Case, Coors Brewing, and many, many others. So I've been in this triangle. I know the triangle. I lived there for 30 years. And I did nothing but look at it, analyze it, move it. Projects we do are trains, change, they would assign us to change the culture of an organization. So you have to figure out how does that work from the top down? How do you, how do you move it one way? You want to make people sophisticated. You want to select the right people. How do you select the right people? So getting criteria, assessment centers, how to assess people. So those are the kind of things that I worked with. I was a, Actually, I was an executive coach for the last 10 years, so I got to work with, I don't know, when the edge where, the, where people meet the psychopathology, you know, I was working right in there. So, although I did do some psychopaths, I mostly saw them because of their results going down in the organization. So what we're going to talk about today is this pyramidal organization, its weaknesses, the fact that it's falling apart now, uh, the fact that it can't continue, and uh, some ways, and there are many more that I'm going to explain to you, that we can defeat this triangle organization. And I'm talking about the one right behind Catherine's head there. <clears throat> That's a pretty flat organization. And they get much higher, much, much higher, especially in the uh, public sector where there's no downside to hiring people, you can fund anything because basically you don't have measurable outcomes, all you have is politics. Okay, there's a problem with explaining this, uh, this these concepts. It's kind of like teaching a fish about water. You have to get them to notice it because this structure is so pervasive um, that it's hard to notice. So to pull people out of whatever they're doing, their TV, their sports, whatever they're doing, and notice the structure that's captured you 
that's run your life, that runs your life right now, and is doing these horrible things to Catherine, drug trafficking, you have to know what's captured you. So that's, first of all, I wanted to draw your attention that you're swimming in it, um, that it's all around you, but it's not natural. Unlike water, it's not natural at all. This is an unnatural design that I believe was superimposed over humans uh, maybe 9,000 years ago. It's an organization, it's, a, uh, it's like a net. It's like a net that was captured, that was cast over us when we were in a more innocent stage. And this net, this triangle, this pyramid, I'll call it a pyramid and a triangle intermittently, has been something that we've suffered through, but now I can see that it's not going to continue with us. They know it's not going to continue with us. They know people are waking up to it. There's a big an anarchical movement. Anarchists are, are popping up because they're seeing the futility in government, the triangular, top-down capture that the government has. It has to use its organs of violence to keep you trapped. All organizations, all pyramidal organizations have organs of violence and they use violence to keep you in this organization. Uh, but first of all, we have to notice it. It's a slave structure and it's been around forever. Can I ask one question which oh, just please. popped into my mind? Okay, go ahead. Because just because for the fundamental understanding, because when I try to figure out why it's so prevalent, because literally if you type into any internet search organigram, you will always get this structure. You know, sometimes they are entire departments, sometimes it's a bit, you know, different, but it's overall this sort of structure. And I always thought that's because fundamentally humans are group animals. So if you look at this, you have these little groups following a leader and then other groups following a leader and so on. Did it not arise naturally? Do you think that we, we all just assumed um, that we can go on, you know, group together and then follow a leader like we do as, as human beings and maybe have done for thousands of years? And maybe the problem is that you know, these group leadership structures were never designed for anything more than 60 people or so, you know, for tribes larger right. than 60 people. But as soon as we, and with 60 people, you don't have this problem of psychopaths. You know, you maybe have one tribe and four right. or two that has a psychopath, but otherwise they are fairly safe. But when we start clustering together, you know, into larger nations and larger global organizations, we really have just the entire top entirely psychopathic no advisors who are not essentially of that thinking. Right. So I, I almost thought, but, but then again, you're right that in a sense it was superimposed on us because of all the wars, right? Every single time you had tribes, they started taking over other tribes and slowly they became bigger tribes and so on. So in a sense, maybe they were imposed on us by the psychopaths who, who led the warring tribes. Uh, right, there's a, there's a lot in that question. <laughs> I think that there are uh, people naturally organize. Uh, they organize, I've noticed, and this is going to be the second part of this talk. I've noticed they organize into autonomous structures. Mm -hmm. And uh, when I, I had the opportunity to uh, study these autonomous structures by, while, while building autonomous work teams. And um, I wanted to find out what kind of leadership it took to move these things around. And I found out after working for weeks with people from various organizations uh, who came together in these like ad hoc teams, that leadership is to say that it's overblown and uh, is so important as an understatement. Leadership, the leadership is, is, is irrelevant. What's important for people is followership and commitment to a goal. Uh, mm -hmm. The fact that one person can pop up and lead this way or pop up and lead that way is, is kind of natural to people. Uh, it's the governments have an organization structure where it's, it starts with the top 
and it started with the divine right of king. They got their information from God, and then they would go down through the organization, and the guy above you knew more than you did. And that's how, that's the clunky organization that we brought for 9,000 years. That's the enslaving organization. That's the, that's the organization that enslaved Babylon. That's the, that's the organization that has kept human beings from self-actualizing, from becoming truly human, because we're mm -hmm. under this structure. Um, what happens when you form a community without, um, without authority? It doesn't mean you don't have rules, it just means you don't have rulers. People are more content, they're more motivated, and they become human. They're not, their behavior isn't, de isn't determined by some psychopath telling them what to do. You see, as a human, you're responsible for what you do. There's no way around it. And we'll talk about that over and over today. You're responsible for what you do. And if the psychopath above you or someone above you tells you what to do, you have to decide in your mind whether you're going to do that or not. Now, in those organizations, you can't decide in your, in your mind. Because in terms of governments, or even in organizations, they'll use violence against you if you don't do what they tell you. In violence, I mean they'll either cut you off, move you out. So you have to. Mm -hmm. So, so let, let me go through some, some notes I have. We're going to go back to this organization structure over and over again. Um, first of all, it, uh, it's the basic matrix. It's the human control system for a millennium. Uh, it, in, it institutionalizes inequality. There are rulers and there are those below. And I think it was Plato who said, yeah, well, we want to tell them there are two types of people. There are the rulers and there are followers. Even though it's not true, we have to maintain that, that illusion. And this is the structure that they maintain it through. This is how they rule you. Few control the many. So uh, this is the way a few psychopaths, and I would say the ruling elite, are made up of, oh, I don't know, maybe 10,000 psychopaths that control all the governments and all the organizations in the world, and they couldn't do it without that structure. They absolutely need that structure. Human humanity does not need that structure. They mm -hmm. need that structure. Okay, um, they survive. The structure survives by violence. Most of them will have organizations, uh, organs of violence. It might be called the military, it might be called the police, it might be called the human resource department. But your organizations of violence are there. Also, they survive on secrecy and exclusivity. Uh, the information at the top is not going to come down unless you need it. They can compartmentalize it so they can do they can cause people to do horrible things like they're doing to Catherine. They can, try, they can, they can put a whole division like, uh, uh, what's his name, uh, Teledyne, Dynecourt. They can do, have a whole division that does child tra trafficking. And the guy, mm -hmm. the other vice president in the other division wouldn't have any idea what's going on. It's yeah, so you mean this entire part can be then captured doing horrible things, whereas the other part you know, stays relatively clean. Yeah. Because of this division, so that here, none of the people ever see what's happening in the other half. Exactly, that's how they do it. They, they need that structure to do it. Also, secrecy. You don't want uh, the people at the bottom to know what you're thinking about, because you might want to eliminate this whole green area uh, mm. on Tuesday morning. I've seen it happen where it was uh, announced Tuesday morning that their jobs were gone Wednesday. Eliminated. Uh, like well, this, think, or entire, this entire part, you mean, entire I think department. In that, in that particular instance, I'm talking about they eliminated 95 people that day. But they couldn't tell them before because they'd find other jobs. And it, so it, it, it depends on secrecy. Also, as we were talking before, and this will come up over and over again, it's a psychopath magnet. 
in a community where there's no hierarchy, where that doesn't exist, psychopaths are meted out as children. You see, if you're growing up as a psychopath, you sit there, you have a little brother, and your little brother has a puppy, and the puppy dies, and your brother becomes totally distraught because the puppy's died. Well, you have no idea what's going on. You have no empathy. You don't know about puppy. Who cares? What, who cares? So you learn to copy them. You learn to copy the emotions so you don't stand out. So you become better at being a human than they are. I mean, if you look at the Clintons, I could point out a hundred different psychopaths. If you look at them and their emotionality, um, they're just... Uh, they're just more appropriate than appropriate sometimes because they've learned mm. to copy you. And they can survive in, in, a, in, a, um, in a society that has these magnets because they can rise. You see, in order for them to move up in the organization, it's, it's very easy. You can use sabotage. You can use murder. I was funny, I was coaching several years ago. Actually, I haven't done this for 10 years, so it's been a while. And I was coaching a, uh, a director level guy and he was uh, talking about his two sons. And his two sons were both bright, athletic, you know, everything that you'd want a boy to be. But he favored this one particular son. And I asked him why. He says, because he's ruthless. Now, he knew, he had been in an organization, those organizations long enough to know that the boy that was ruthless was going to the top because he wasn't hampered by, you're not hampered by common sense or anything. And you really learn to read organizational dynamics if you're a psychopath. So anyway, it's a psychopath magnet. And as long as we maintain those things, as long as we revere those things, you're going to have psychopaths. You're going to have a place for them to be, and you're going to have a place for them to rule you. Uh, mm -hmm. Also, just as a point before I move on, they're absolutely necessary for wars, hegemony. Um, you can have battles. You can have fights. But you can only have wars if you don't have that structure. So mm -hmm. it's something we've been struggling through and uh, for a long time. But I think... I think it's over because, quite frankly, we're waking up to the fact that it's a psychopath magnet. People now can come out. They can identify governments as having it and governments as being a problem. What I want to do with this, with this presentation is to enlarge their scope of the ruling elite's tools to include uh, corporations and organizations. And we'll get into corporations later, which are very, 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 very dangerous. Very, very dangerous things. So, question so far? See, I was thinking that if, given that we, um, you know, we are now talking about this and what we're going to be talking about is also what to do about it, but I think once we realize that these are psychopath magnets, it's, it's almost like um, you realize that they have deep capture, you know, deep capture by psychopaths. What I mean by that is they, yeah. at some point, they entirely capture the upper, you know, the boardroom. They make the decisions totally by themselves. And if you have a pyramid organization, you essentially invite deep capture. It's deep capture. It's a deep capture machine by design, right? It's a psychopath exactly. magnet, which leads to deep capture by psychopaths. So it's almost like... Um, I think after a while, you know how in the olden days we didn't used to have food labeling and you didn't have right. any idea what was in your food. And these days, most European countries and the US have little, almost like in the UK you have um, like traffic lights. You know, if, it's, if it has a lot of salt or fat, it will show up red on the packaging right. and will say this is really bad for you. But we need almost like health warnings for these organizations and say as soon as right. you have, you know, these days we... Um, you know, the Foreign Office gives warnings to travelers if they're going to a dictatorship and they say, you know, it's not really safe to travel there right now because this guy has gone mad. Well, you know, similarly, we should also say as soon as you have an organization that has this structure, you know, one day as we're cycling to other systems, we can give health warnings and say, well, we have to watch this organization because sooner or later, 
it will be captured by psychopaths. It will run out of control. Yeah, you know exactly. It's and it's generally generally they're started by psychopaths now. <clears throat> and what, it, what the good news is, <clears throat> there's a natural human structure that um, this organization is defenseless against. Uh, it can consistently and always will consistently outperform. It's faster moving. It's trickier. It works on humanity's um, divine creativity. And uh, there's only so much you can get out of this structure. This is slave structure. Mm. And you can only motivate slaves with, uh, well, you, you can basically give them bribes, but you basically motivate them with violence. Mm. So uh, without uh, violence motivation, if you motivate somebody with, uh, by their own ingenuity, by employing their own brain, by employing their synergy, working with other people, you get a much faster moving organization. Mm. And flat, flat, flat is the, is the thing. I don't even, I've worked with organizations with no external leadership that function fine on their own. I, you said, I, I think we can go as large as communities. You, know, like you, were, you were saying 60 people. Uh, I've worked with teams from three to 12. Um, the, constraint, the constraints are generally informational in nature. In that in a flat structure, everybody knows everything. And so you have frequent meetings. So you have to all be together to keep the structure going. And there's no need for a big, clunky, moving, slave uh, thing like that. Um, so I've seen it happen. And uh, they, the little article I sent you, and we're going to try to link it below. Mm -hmm. It talks about when I got into organizations, how this, this naturally, natural tendency of human con autonomous configurations kept popping up. I mean, you couldn't, uh, and it doesn't fit in this organization. It just does not fit in. And I'll get into that as I go through this uh, thing. The phenomenon I found is autonomous organization, and it works. Um, they don't need any supervision, but they do need uh, to set themselves goals and measurable results, and we'll talk about that later. Let me go deeper into that structure, see if I can get, <clears throat> I, think, I think the way I look at this is rather obtuse. It's a very um, critical look at this because I've seen how without this structure human beings act and how with this structure human beings act. And human beings, from my study in consciousness studies, act more like humans. They, they uh, rise to higher level of functioning when they're not dictated by basically psychopaths. So let's look at the pyramid. It's a top-down structure. Information radiates from above. And I said that comes from the divine right of kings. And this, uh, I've seen it able to manufacture everything. I've seen it manufacture jet plane motors, uh, pharmaceuticals. I mean, it's really good because the top-down structure, it's clunky. Um, it can't compete with the team-based environment because every question has to go up the ladder and back down the ladder, and you can't move quickly, and people feel enslaved, and you can blame your boss. And Anyway, it's a top-down structure. It works for the manufacturing of everything except information, which is what we're going to talk about at the end, because information is the most important thing manufactured now and that doesn't work on it. When you manufacture information in the, tra in the pyramid, it has to, it sets up a little barrier in it. It's like, a, it's like an anti, it's like an antacid barrier inside the organization to have these cells manufacture information. And it can't interfere with the top-down structure. So it's got to be insulated. And they, they insulate it with a position called a project manager. I don't know whether you 
project managers in CERN or wherever you were working, they're, they're incredible people because they have to walk the tightrope between the top down and generating information. So, mm -hmm. they, so the organizations naturally have these barriers. And when we talk about the, uh, later on, we talk about the intelligence organizations, it's doubly difficult for them because a lot of their cells are going to manufacture information that could damage the structure. That's why I think the organizational, they know that triangle is obsolete, so they're moving toward AI. But there's a problem with AI. And I'll talk about the problem with AI they're going to find a little bit later. Okay. Um, must do what the bosses say. Guidance is always from above. You always have to get approvals from money, repairs, or days off. So it always goes up. Runs, a lot of organizations will run all the way up to the psychopath. Now, it used to be that the buck would stop at the top. So you could blame people. You know, if you could blame the boss. The manager would be responsible for what the supervisors are doing. But now we find that they're they're cutting, they're, they'll, they'll throw this part of the organization under the bus. It's, it's no longer a, uh, a tight thing. I think this is part of the breakdown of the pyramid that we're going to see that's going to continue. Uh, it must be secret of, I think we went over that, can't let the slaves know. It's a psychopath magnet. It also separates the initiator from the actor. <clears throat> no. I've noticed that when the uh, evil elite are going to do something, they give us fore forewarning. And I don't know why they do that, really. Uh, they seem to tell us the 911 is going to occur through movies and this and that. And they'll give us these little warnings that most people don't even know about because they're watching TV. But people that are awake and people that are developing know these things. So. So they noticed this, that we're getting warned. Now, why would that be? One of the reasons could be escaping culpability. If these people think that, uh, I'm assuming that these psychopaths are also Satanists, which I think it, what would keep you from becoming a Satanist if you're a psychopath? It's a source of power. Mm -hmm. It is a source of power. That's why they do rituals. Now, whether they work or not, I don't know. They think they do. They sacrifice children to Moloch every year in the U.S. <clears throat> well, anyway, it separates the initiator from the actor. If you think of all the people that Barack Obama has killed in all his wars, you can say he's killed millions of people. But he's actually killed nobody. Because he's way separated from his actions people that are going to be responsible for killing those people are the people that carried out his orders. So I think that's another reason they like this hierarchy because they can decide to do stuff. Well, they can look what Soros does through his organizations. Look at the people that he's killed. Look at the problems that he's caused. He hasn't done any of that. All he's done is written checks. So I think that's another reason they like it. Also, I want you to look at publicly traded pyramids, publicly traded organizations. Now, I don't know how this is in the UK, but in the United States, if you're a publicly traded organization, you're mandated by law to be a psychopath organization. And since in the US law, we consider those people, they consider uh, corporations people, they are mandated to be psychopathic. In other words, these organizations have to work totally for the, they have, their actions have to be totally in the best interest of their stockholders. So if it's in the best interest of, of their stockholders to wipe out an Amazonian village to get to the oil, they have to do it. It's a psychopathic organization, it's mandated. And if you have a guy coming in there, a nice guy that takes over from a psychopath, I don't know how that could ever happen. Uh, they, 
they would be sued. I mean, you you have to act in the best interest of your stockholders. So mm -hmm. you're mandated to be psychopathic. Um, and as I said before, it does not work for the production of knowledge. They have to use the autonomous configuration that we're going to talk about later and insulate it from the pyramid as, as thickly as they can because information generated can kill the pyramid. Okay. And when we talk about the spy agencies later, you can imagine how... Uh, insulated the people that are generating that information, the people that are looking at you. And if we talk about how the people that are gang stalking you are organized, believe me, they're working in this pyramid and they're taking orders from a psychopath. They're probably a psychopath themselves, but they're not autonomous. They have to work on orders. They have to report back. They're part of that slow, clunky organization that gives us speed, agility, and ability to react and interact with them uh, in, in an effective way. Any questions right now on, on what we've done so far? I want to move into what the other thing would look like. I think that's, that's what we should get on to. That's what I'm burning to actually hear because, um, you know, I, as you were speaking, I was going through my mind about all the many examples I can find um, about organizations that have gone psychopathic. And I realized that I cannot think of a single field where organizations haven't by now turned psychopathic. You know, in a sense, the fact that the military has an, an, this set up and, and this must be run by psychopaths who are willing to murder people in the millions, you know, that's, that's a given. Um, we're now hearing more and more what the intelligence agencies have been up to, but look at any other field. I mean, major corporations have gone through scandals. I, don't, I cannot think of a single large corporation that didn't have a major scandal that involved harming people in one way or another. Right. You know, food companies, um, agricultural companies, everything. Right. So um, I think that just underlines that um, we, I mean, if you actually add up how many people have died as a result of deep capture through psychopaths, right. you know, right. it's, it's immeasurable. And this, it, this includes governments, you know, this includes totalitarian governments, but as you rightly say, also corporations. And I think this is people in the back of their minds kind of know that corporations can be bad, but in a sense, there are many more large corporations than their governments. So by now, the total of number number of people you know harmed by by large corporations will be much much larger than the number of people harmed by governments. So we have to we have to pivot away from this model at all costs if we really want to you know save lives. Right. Right. Uh, if you look at the pharmaceutical industry, which I'm totally concerned, uh, worked for it for years. <clears throat> They have allied with the CDC and the lobbyists to push vaccines on the public. It's an incredibly profitable uh, endeavor because vaccines not only uh, cost money, but they allow you to inject poisons into people that can enhance your bottom line down the road. Now, if I were somehow appointed by somebody to be head of, I don't know, uh, Glasgow, what's it, Smith? Glasgow, I, think, I, I can't ever remember the name of it. But, uh, and I would move away from mandating vaccines that would hurt my bottom line. Well, my stockholders could have me removed immediately because I was going against their best interest. So, so it's mandated that they'd be psychopaths. And if you were a person, and there are psychopaths out there, but if you met a person and all he was interested in was the bottom line, making money, return to him, he's a psychopath. You wouldn't be friends with him. I can, I can it's, it's amazing. So let's talk about uh, how people naturally work together. Uh, I can go back to the first time I was I, I'm, a, I'm a training and development guy. I'm working in a uh, retail organization, and the vice presidents fly around, and 
sometimes they use commercial planes and they read uh, in-flight magazines and these damn in-flight magazines. They got, they would come back waving an in-flight magazine and, th and throw something on my desk. We got to try this. We got to. So anyway, it was about quality circles. And this is in, in the article I wrote, and we're going to try to list below. The first time I saw this, so they said, well, let's try it. Well, I studied up on quality circles. And what it is, you just talk to the people who are doing the work, and you ask them how they can improve their numbers. Most people, this was back in 1978 or 79, so they didn't measure much. They just had people work. And uh, you learn quickly that the minute you measure something, it improves. Mm -hmm. uh, I can remember years later putting a counting device on photo processing machines. And the people in that plant were going crazy trying to, they, they immediately were competing with one another, trying to get better numbers. Well, anyway, so they gave me a data processing group. And at this point, it was data entry is what it was. And these women were data entry. And they were so flattered that I would talk to them and ask them how they could improve. You know, and uh, the improvements that they made were seating changes. Uh, the, uh, there were two women who were sitting facing a window. And during two hours during the day, there was a reflection on the glass window across the, in the other building. And they couldn't see very well. So by moving their chairs, they increased their, so it, things would happen automatically. So we got back the second time and uh, everything improved. All, all the numbers improved. So we were gonna have a meeting and go on. Well, I was pulled by the vice president off of that project. Why? Because I saw the first time the, uh, the, the ellipse, the flat organization disrupting the organization structure because mm -hmm. the, the supervisor, he was in trouble. I went in and a week later, I was doubling his numbers. His manager was in trouble. So I was, I was bounced out of there in a hurry. And that happened over and over again. Every time, every time we happened. And, and later on in my career, I was developing, uh, running uh, autonomous teams and uh, these teams could outperform anything. Um, I could tell you a story about uh, a friend of mine had built autonomous structures in Miller Brewing Company. That's a big brewing company, and they had uh, they had at one point in their um, evolution, I think it was in the 70s, they built too many beer plants, and so they put a couple in mothballs for a few years. Well, one of them was, they were coming out of mothballs. Is that obvious what I mean by that? Yeah, absolutely, yes. They were put on ice in a sense. They were putting yeah. them back online. And the one manager had been reading up, and he had a best friend who was my really close friend who was into team-based environments. And I know some people have had bad experiences with these, but I've had incredible experiences. And so my friend put together with this guy, they started... They opened this plant being a team-based environment plant, meaning there was a manager, and he interfaced with the upper management. Everything else was done, done in teams. No supervision. The supervision was, hand, was a shared authority in what they called at that point a star system, which I can explain in depth if we decide to go forward with this a little bit more. Um, but what happened was the first year they started the plant off, it was very tough to get started. The second year when this manager of this plant would go in, he was a director level, I believe. He would go in with the other directors of the other plants. They would joke and make fun of him by saying things like, we spill more beer than you're able to bottle every year. And they would laugh. The third year he pulled even. The fourth year he was doubling the output of any other brewery. brewery. So uh, proved it prove the efficiency. What I'll tell you, what happened though, they shut the plant down. Why? It interfered with the top-down structure. Uh, it wasn't right. It wasn't, even though they were making money hand over fist, they couldn't keep the influence from going up. So when I was doing this, 
uh, we were able to build flat organizations. Uh, actually, we were able to build a flat organization and then a flat organization on top of it in terms of management. But anyway, no bosses, no authority. Now, the stuff that I made always reported up to a pyramidal organization. Uh, they have these things. They have self-directed teams in the military. Special forces ops people have self-directed teams. Actually, they've done a lot of uh, uh, they've done a lot of the initial work and how that how that system sets up and how it works and what expertise you need in these different individuals. But they still report up to the structure, and as long as they're connected to the structure. They're going to be confined by the structure. What I'm advocating is autonomous teams with no connection. We might call them teams. We might call them groups. We might call them communities. But they're going to outperform this structure. And they're going to form the basis that's going to liberate human consciousness from this horrible oppression that we've been working under for the sake of productivity. Now, what you're going to have to go through and what you're going to, your listeners might have to go through is to noodle through productivity. How, does the, how has this given us productivity? And I want you to think like, what is productivity? What productivity does human consciousness need? What, how, are, how, how have they trapped us into thinking that this is necessary for us? Mm. Uh, I, you, you need to think about that on your own. Uh, we can yeah, do that later mm -hmm. on. We can take it deeper. But without a people, without authority, people are free to do the right thing all of the time. You don't have to compromise. You don't mm -hmm. have to fire the guy that can't seem to get here to work on time because his baby is in daycare. You, you don't have to fire him. You can figure out something else to do. He can work a different thing. You, you don't, you're not ordered to kill people in this structure. Mm. Nobody orders you. I, I, I'm a believer in natural law. I think people, people are moral and they're right-thinking beings. And you mm. know within yourself whether you're doing the right thing. When somebody violates you by... Uh, committing violence, taking something from you, or forcing you to do something that's in, in direct opposition to natural law. You have the mm. right to use force against them. Force and violence are two different things. This is mm. from Mark Passio's study. Do you know Mark Passio? He's a, he's a researcher and he's an ex-Satanist, actually. Mm, yeah. The separation between violence and force. And mm. The, these autonomous teams certainly can use force. And I'm going to advocate them using force. Anyway, mm -hmm. without a four, 40 people are free to do the right thing, uh, there's no remorse. And since you're involved in deciding what you do, mm -hmm. um, you're, of course, enrolled in what you're doing. Your spirit is there. You're not just hands and being forced to do this. And an autonomous team, there's no bosses, it's all shared responsibility. And now I can, I'll go into, if we decide to go further in this, I'll go into how this actually works, how you share the responsibility, and how you can set up one of these teams pretty quickly. It doesn't require, it requires a little bit of unlearning. Because we're taught in school to be obedient and follow orders. This is not about obedience. This is not about following the order. You learn that obedience is the worst thing you can do. Doing things on your own, doing the right thing in conjunction with your brothers and sisters on this team is the right thing to do. Uh, it has to be worked on measurable goals. Otherwise, <clears throat> it gets too fragmented right now. I think later as consciousness evolves, will know the right thing. Uh, I know that you are in the stage in your development now where you get up in the morning and you know the right thing to do. You know I need to go to Germany. 
You know I need to call this person. You know I'm moving on this. You don't, you don't write it down, you don't make the list, and you know what to do. When you're doing the right thing, when you're inconsistent, when you're consistent with natural law, you don't the right thing to do in the morning. You don't have to do lists. But right now, starting off, we need to have measurable goals. What are we going to do? Mm -hmm. uh, let's say a measurable goal would be um, alert everybody in your state or your county as to the dangers of the government and the triangle organizations that keep us enslaved. Just make mm -hmm. a presentation. Let's make it to all the school boards. Let's make it all to all the uh, local governments. I wouldn't go much higher than that because there's too many psychopaths. You're not, you can't deal, you're not going to change a psychopath. But that could be a goal. It could be a goal, several TIs together, watching one another's back, exposing what could be done. Uh, working in a group like that, you're so much faster and more mobile than the TI people, not the TI people than the people who are oppressing you and you have so many more eyes and you have so mm. many more outlets to get them through but you need a measurable goal how, how are you going to do this what do you want to accomplish that's important mm. in these in our stage of team development right now i think later on we'll all know i think we're getting back the psychic how can i say this i think we're getting back the psychic ability that's ours and the way to relate to people that's ours. We're learning mm. that back, but it's not back yet. So measurable goals are important. Uh, it may take transition skills, and I'll try to put together presentations on these transition skills. How to get along with people, how to make a decision when there's four of you. I mean, there's, there's techniques that you can use, and there's ways to do that that, I can, that we, can, we can put down. <clears throat> but I want people to be excited about um, getting together and sharing responsibilities and being able to group together to oppose this force that's, that's, that's weighing down on us. We're so much faster. We're so much more flexible. We're so much more creative. We're, we're connected with the divine creator. Well, we really are. And we don't need to be sat on. So I was going to go into some more ideas on ways that we could use this, but you can help me brainstorm that. I mean, what, what do you think so far, Catherine? Are we on? Are we on target? Am I? Am I? Absolutely. I actually, I basically, what I wanted to put down is um, because this this big behemoth this the pyramid organization we're talking about, and these autonomous groups um, or autonomous organizations. What did they look like? I mean, were they really just um, like groups, teams of people who were, you know, kind of, they had connections internally and otherwise were um, maybe working. So they would have, you know, connections amongst themselves like that. Yes. And they may work with other teams, you know, across the board, things yeah. like that. Yeah, yeah, you could, yeah. It's what what would interest me is what was um what was did you have an optimal um, group size? What was the the, the size of the group well, of, the, of these autonomous groups? When we like were, the smallest unit. The smallest unit should be two. Two people. Two people. Uh, we used to say twelve, because we in in our in our configuration, what we were trying to do was produce uh, jet engines or produce. Um, pharmaceuticals and uh, I can I can tell you how, how it looks um, we would redesign the, um, the f let's say it's a manufacturing environment there's there's two different types of teams that I work with there's process teams and there's uh, product teams um, the uh, process teams and product teams. your process teams would build something so let's say we're putting together a pharmaceutical. You take the supervisors out, get, you get them out of there, and you get the, the people who are making the stuff in a room and say, okay, uh, here's, here's the numbers that we can make now. Um, how, can we, how can we speed this up? And we spend three days, and we draw it on the organization chart, and we draw flow charts, and we say, well, you don't need this process. 
Well, one thing that I learned early on uh, doing diagnosis in organizations for efficiency, it's called the third, the, uh, the third shift rule. One of the first things you learn. When you go into a manufacturing environment, I suppose it would work on other environments, although I never tried it. You go and you meet with management and da 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 da, -da. And then you schedule your first week to work on third shift. Because third shift doesn't have the triangle. They're working by themselves. There ain't nobody around. They can get the stuff done. And so you watch them get it done. Then you take this, what you learn back to the organization. Stop doing this. Stop doing that. Stop doing that. And you become a hero just because you learned the third, third shift rule. And uh, anyway, people are gonna people do it automatically. They they'll uh, if they're unencumbered by the triangle, they'll self organize. Organize. Now we always had to report to the organization. We always had to report numbers up, and of course it got buried in the team. And the and there was always well in the uh, in the organization I had uh, I told you about with Miller. The, I, I watched the organization in, a, in structures that they built similarly at Coors Brewing Company. And the role of the uh, plant manager was of an umbrella. He would protect the teams, which were producing vast amounts of beer, from the organization above superimposing their values and superimposing their for example, I can remember uh, Dennis, a friend of mine who was a plant manager, he said, well, you got to give your plant the, uh, the Employee of the Year Award. Which Employee of the Year? Send us his name. Well, Dennis can't do that because they're all, we're, we're all one. We're all working together. So he'd give them a name. But he would also say, look, I have to give them a name. We'll, we'll do it alphabetically. Uh, but to protect them from the buffoonery that the, that the, that the pyramid wants, wants, you, wants you in. <clears throat> so what, what I think we can do with autonomous teams that don't need the pyramid is they can connect with one another. Uh, I, I'm thinking that uh, back in the day, Actually, this is during my lifetime. There was a company called uh, Volvo. I think they still make automobiles, but they're owned by Ford Motor now. And they mm -hmm. made it in Sweden. They made these wonderful Volvos in Sweden, and they made them one at a time. A team would start, and they'd assemble these Volvos. And the teams knew the pride in the Volvos back then were incredible they were like driving a tank i mean they they were incredible pieces of workmanship and I, actually i've taught people how to build um, jet engines like this and team based taking it apart how the team can at the end of the, what we would do is we would produce a jet engine and i did this in europe we would produce a jet engine and then we would debrief for a day we'd come off the line we were so productive that we could come off the line for a day and debrief. What went well? What didn't go well? What got in the way? How can we slick it up? And then they'd go back and they'd produce another one and they'd do another day. So, so it's a self-correcting, self-evolving. It's, it's human. It's natural. It's the way we organize. It's the way, if you can imagine a hunting team. Uh, oh, I, the one we used to always use uh, was a... Uh, a jazz band. <clears throat> if you listen to jazz, and I don't know what kind of music you listen to, but jazz or blues or um, what they do is they all these people have different roles. Some of them come in and take the lead, and the other one take the lead, and and they go in and out, and it's just beautiful music together. That's what mm -hmm. a high performing team can go mm -hmm. can get to, where you know the other people. But you have to meet a lot. You have to be in touch with them a lot. And uh, if you can get in touch with them personally, it's better because using their media might slow us down. 
uh, what else can I tell you about teens? Teens, um, teens go through uh, various stages, and I can and I can I can fill this out if if I can get a chance to make a couple things on teens. Uh, first of all, there's the uh, there's the uh, formal getting together where people are very formal with one another. Uh, and then there's, uh, then there's a stage where they go through where they can function normally as long as they're checking in. Mm -hmm. Then, moving on to high performing, they get to the stage where they storm, they call it the storming stage, mm -hmm. where they correct, it's a lot of organizational correction. Who made you boss? You can't tell me to do that. Da -da -da -da. It's normal, it's a normal uh, setting in to high performing. And then they'll click into high performance. So you go from, I think it's, it's uh, uh, conforming, norming, storming, high performing. And uh, but you have to work together. And there's no reason why you can't, you know, you could do huge projects with this, but you'd have to link your groups together and they'd be so much more effective. Because, you know, if you look at the organization behind you, if they're manufacturing something, these one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight people on the bottom support everybody. Their productivity yeah. supports everybody. The guys above them produce nothing. The guys above them produce less. The guy above them produces less. He, those, the top, the top two or three organization uh, levels of an organization are only worried about politics, their own safety, their own survival, and getting to the next level. Total concern. Uh, the mm -hmm. fact that they have to report something going up the ladder is incidental to what they're really about. They're really mm -hmm. about their own career because they're not producing anything. They don't do anything. It's like we used to always say, which, if you took the, uh, if you took the bottom eight, eight eight digits on your little thing, how much would that organization produce? Yeah. You realize. You just take these out. What would it produce? What would the organization produce? Yeah, absolutely nothing. Nothing. If you take the top organization out and leave the bottom <laughs> in there. See, this is, this is very interesting because. Um... What would the organization produce now? Everything, total, total, everything. You can take this in the, the supervisory level off. Because I can, I can build organizations where you don't need the supervisory level. Yeah, but and then if, if you actually calculate it, we have eight people producing everything. And this is a simple, simple diagram, right? Um, yeah, and then we've got two, four, six, seven people. So eight people producing something and seven people not producing anything. Exactly. So it's almost as many people. Right. And then if you go to governments, they don't produce anything the whole time, all the way up. <laughs> all they are is are wielders of organization, uh, the organs of violence to keep you in line and keep you paying. So you can do 12 to 12, uh, 12 uh, 2 to 12 people. I would imagine you could have uh, larger groups than that, depending on what you're doing. Uh, what I'm advocating. You mean these guys, yeah. You could, you could have larger groups. Uh, you can even have community. This could be how we learn to build communities back. See, because we're, as, as, as humans evolve past the stage where we're superimposed by the triangle, we're going to look different. Mm. We're not going to be looking for leadership from the top. We're going to be looking for ways we can expand. People, mm. are, have, people who achieve higher levels of ego development, consciousness development. Uh, they look out for other people. Actually, they become the opposite of a psychopath. And they actually, as a, at a certain level, they become only interested in their own development and the development of the people around them. So mm -hmm. they turn into something different. They're not out for the new car. They're out for how can I get Kath, Catherine involved in what I'm doing and how can she help us because we can help her. How can I, mm. you know, how can we, how can we work together? And how can we work together to get 
these wars over? How can we help together to stop this TI? How can we work together to stop child trafficking, for heaven's mm -hmm. sakes? I've seen, as we were working with the Hampstead cover-up, <clears throat> Ella and Abraham, who are the two uh, parents who got their, got their children taken because of the satanic ritual abuse, um, not theirs, the, the father's mm -hmm. satanic ritual abuse, they were able to hook up with people who were studying this, and they found all the lines of all the imports of the child trafficking. They could, they know who they were going to, who was receiving them. It was all laid out. That's what you can do as an autonomous team, mm -hmm. all working together. That's, I'll tell you another configuration that's actually popping up automatically is this, uh, James Corbett used it all the time. He calls it uh, investigative reporting, self-investigating reporting. You remember how many calls? Yeah, it? it's like a citizen investigation. Citizen oh, like, investigation. Yeah, or open, open source intelligence. Open it's source intelligence. That's a team-based yeah. environment. That's a team-based environment. Superimpose an authority on that or give that a, any more of a structure than that other than checking in and you're going to take away the humanity and you're going to put yeah. it back into the structure. Now, also notice how non-vulnerable we are in this structure as opposed to how vulnerable they are in that yeah. structure. They're slow moving. They're an easy target and they're easily sabotaged because mm. we're, and we're fast moving we're in and out and we can configure however is best for us and we don't have to tell them anything we have to tell us stuff uh, i do want to emphasize before we do go much further the importance of followership i <clears throat> what happened was i i was i was devising a course for team leaders. And in the teams that we built, the leadership roles would, would rotate. Like in an organization, the supervisor is responsible for safety, productivity, um, maintenance, and all these things. Well, what you do is you remove the supervisor and you plop the, give these things to the different team members and they rotate them. They have them for a while and then they mm -hmm. rotate them back and forth. But they have to know, they have to be trained. Um, so, uh, so what I would do, I took, we did this two weeks in a row, and I took uh, leaders in team-based environments. I'm trying to think of the organization. I think Harley-Davidson, Lucent Technologies, uh, definitely Novartis Pharmaceuticals, and other people who were into team-based environments. Now, subsequently, team-based environments disappeared from the, for the uh, American landscape because you can't compete with slavery. So they took all the manufacturing to China. I mean, mm. nothing's cheaper than slave labor. Mm. So anyway, so I had these people in the room and well, I, was, I, was, I was studying leadership skills that they needed for the different team environments. So I would give them um, projects to work on. And most of these projects were uh, putting things together since they were, a lot of times they were engineers putting things together, dividing, devising a, a way to make something out of something. And I would watch them. And what I noticed was the leader, the leader coming and going had very little effect on the team. What had an effect on the team was the motivation of the team to be a team, to get that, to get that thing done, to get the project done, to get the, uh, measurable result. Mm -hmm. And if you take away the constraints of the organization, you're going to see how, uh, how quickly they reorganize into something real effective. There was a game that I used to start off with teams, and I, I would toss a, uh, a ball into a, maybe 15 people. And they would pass it around until everybody got to have that ball. And I'd say, okay, do it again, only do it faster. And uh, so they went, and they would do it faster and faster. And I'd say, okay, isn't there any way you can get faster? So somebody would think, well, let's just line ourselves up so we can pass it. Uh, so they would do that. And I'd say, well, can't you go any faster than that? 
So they would, they would eventually get to the point where they would stand and they would touch the ball. <laughs> and they would all touch the ball and they would have it done. See, if you take away the constraints and let them figure it out for themselves, they can come up with amazing stuff. Human beings are wired like that. That's, yeah. that's what we are. And as soon as we get, as soon as we realize what is oppressing us, and we can mm -hmm. start sliding out from under it, then we can start, start, start doing things that, that are totally, totally amazing. Any questions? Uh, See, this, this is absolutely amazing because um, I also realized that, as you said, this organization is extremely vulnerable because we know you can take away the entire upper tier. But if you actually ever did that, right, I mean, if, if one person is on holiday, that's what typically happens. Yeah. Any decision that needs to be reached goes, you know, first of all, it comes from here, goes up there and then waits, you know, just to wait. <laughs> until wait. the person comes back from holiday, makes a decision and then it goes back down. That's you know, right. I mean, this is just insane. And then another thing that um, I was trying to explain to people is just, um, I mean, as you said, I really love this um, example with the ball because I was, um, if I just may, um, you know, let me um, get a couple of um, different colored magnets because I was, tr as, you, as you just said, you know, this example with the ball, one of the, the points I was making is that this organization is automatically self-correcting. I think you used it, you know, it is, you know, you have meetings all the time, it's continually self-correcting. If there's any problem in a big, big organization and say the customer service here has to, you know, get some customer complaints and then the technical department here has to make, say, any change to the software, you know, yeah. a software bug has been uncovered. Here, you know, it would be just a direct link between maybe the customer service team and the, uh, the technical team. And yeah. it's just a one link, you know, mm -hmm. from one person to the next, only one link. Here, it literally goes, okay, the complaint is flagged up here. You know, the email is passed, then it's passed to the next level, you know, but still these people typically don't have a direct link, you know, right. so you go literally all the way to the top, top and then back down, uh -huh. you know, exactly. and it's exactly. just like a chain, you know, all the way, right. maybe right. some technical departments have got one, two, three, four, five, six, seven people possibly right. just making a decision. And then if there are any questions, what people do is usually pass it back to the person from whom they got the email, you know? So you have these Chinese whispers going around the organizations. It's absolutely hilarious. It is hilarious. And it happens more than what then people realize, you know? So, so well, well, the one that we would deal with all the time is maintenance. Pardon? In, in, a, uh, in, a process uh, in a process team, when they're doing a process, and the, and the line and the line breaks down, you have to go to maintenance. Yeah. Walk over to maintenance. Walk, well, we have to authorize the, the four hours to process the thing, so we have to go to the supervisor. What we would do in the team is throw a maintenance guy in there. And he would fix it because he's part of the team. He yeah. has he has an incentive to make the thing go faster and keep that thing online. And he'll do He'll do his maintenance stuff, like his, he'll grease the stuff while they're while they're down between runs very quickly because he doesn't want to. And when they have to switch, I mean the, the whole thing. The, it's a clunky organization that's that's outgrown its usefulness. Now what the control system is thinking? Well, we can use AI. See, what we'll do is we'll have them report to AI whatever configuration is, and the AI will make. Um, the adjustments. That was the idea behind Jade Helm. Jade Helm or all these semi-autonomous uh, groups of uh, horrible CIA, I don't know, military people who were doing nefarious things and their goal would be dictated and maintained by the AI. So the AI would would give them new orders right away and it would save going up and down the line. Well. I think there's a big problem with that. Now, you know probably a lot more about computers than I do and definitely know more about AI. But it seems to me AI knows stuff. It knows reality and it can learn reality. The globalists don't operate with reality. They operate with their image of reality. 
So it seems to me the reason that we don't, we're not subject by, to a lot of AI right now is because they have to figure out how to make that AI see their reality or function from a reality that's not real. It seems to me they're going to have a lot of trouble reconciling what's going on with the reality that is actually happening on the ground. I, I don't know. I'll, I'll back off I, on my expertise on that one. But, uh, you know, actually, actually, this is really one of the points I would like to make because I, um, we didn't work with AI as such, we work with pattern recognition, but um, you have to be, one of the things, um, well, you can have learning algorithms and things like that, and AI is essentially that on steroids, but one of the things when you have learning algorithms, you learn very quickly, you yourself learn very quickly, is that sometimes you are not clever enough to predict what this thing is going to learn. And to give you an example, I've heard one anecdote, um, and this was that, um, I think it was, um, they were trying to develop AI for the military to pick out um, essentially enemy tanks or Russian tanks. So they, um, you know, they, they trained them and they showed these um, AI programs, pictures of Russian tanks and pictures of American tanks and so on. And they trained the software to essentially take out the Russian tanks and not harm the um, American tanks. And all the tests were beautiful. You know, the AI yeah. was 100% on. And then they tried to do an actual real life you know, example of this, but of course not, you know, with live rounds. And they found out that the AI was taking out American tanks with a rate of 50%. So it had no idea uh -huh. of what was an American tank and what hadn't been. And when, when it was actually overcast, it would take out 100% American tanks. It would take out everybody. And then eventually they realized that what had happened is that the images of the newest Russian tanks would be recorded by spies, it would be in darkness, it would be grainy images, you know, not really clear. And meanwhile, they fed the information about the American equipment, so not just tanks, but any other, you know, war equipment with high resolution images because they wanted to learn the AI to understand. Right. And what the AI had learned is never take out high resolution images and always take out grainy, you know, <laughs> visuals that you can't recognize. So as soon as it became overcast or dark, the AI would eliminate everybody. <laughs> so you have to be very, very careful because, you right. know, you, you set up something, but you don't really know what the computer's right. going to learn, you know. So I and, and the problem, the problem is one of complexity. And this is something that all software programmers know when you want to correct things like that, you know. Because in a sense, you have to become even smarter than the AI to know where the problem is and how to correct it, you know, and it just gets ever, ever more complex. Oh. I think the problem will not be that the AI will become cleverer than us. It will be the AI will utterly malfunction and we will not be clever enough to correct that. I think that's the ultimate limitation. It's, it's, it's a total non-starter for me, you know. Yeah, me too. So I think they're stuck with their pyramid that they've been stuck with for 9,000 years. And we are going to escape from the pyramid. And we're going to start it by doing things like, like let's, let's, let's think about the spy agencies and the agencies that they have, uh, you know, um, child trafficking, drug trafficking, irritating you and, and the fellow TIs. What kind of an organization is that? Well, mm. it's got to report up through that, that beast that you have behind you, the beast system back there. And yeah, uh, well, I, I would say that's, a, that's an organization that has, has gone into deep capture long, long, long ago. Yes. But what, it's essentially... Right. I want to look at, I want to focus on how it interfaces with the part-time people that they employ to stalk you. How, you know, what, what is it? In, uh, is it in Germany, I heard? that people that engage in these TI tactics are given a flat 10% tax rate? Did you, I would did you... think so, yeah. So this is what I found out, is that anybody, well, the actual rule is that anybody who becomes an informant, but I mean, that's essentially what it is. You know, anybody who becomes like an unofficial, you know, contributor right. will have a tax rate of 10%. I mean, isn't that insane? That's it's incredible. But that's how, yeah. see, that's how, that, that's how the organization has to work. Our organization yeah. doesn't have to work like that. We're free. We're free. Mm. We're human. Yeah. And we're in touch with universal consciousness. We're in touch with one another. And we're hell-bent 
on achieving our measurable result, whether it's informing people, whether it's uh, getting a dossier on everybody that's stalking us, whether it's uh, getting a full uh, list of all the weapons and how we can counter those weapons. Uh, mm -hmm. what, whatever our goal is, we're free from that organization. They're not. They have to go up through uh, Angela Merkel, get the tax break, come back down. How, how's that tax break going to work? Well, I get my tax break. It becomes, it becomes a mess for them. And uh, mm -hmm. we're like the little, uh, we're like the little car that can come in and out and do what we want. And all we need to do is, is realize that we are human consciousness. We don't mm -hmm. need the big beast system on top of us. We can function mm -hmm. quite well, thank you. We can build cars, we can build bridges, we can build anything. If you, if you think you need progress in that area, which I'm not sure we do, but there's nothing that we can't do autonomously or as a community that they can do as an oppressive structure. So, well, I think this is the real danger, isn't it? Because what we're saying is that we don't need them. We don't you need know? them. We don't need them. And then this really, there must be this deep existential crisis because they don't do anything. So if we don't need them, and the organization doesn't need them, where do they go, you know? They're parasites. They're yeah. just parasites on, on human consciousness. And we don't need them anymore. So I think that's where the, uh, I mean, now I see, I don't know whether you're familiar with Larkin Rose and, and uh, Mark Passio and uh, who else? Uh, uh, James Corbett. Uh, they're all um, pushing for anarchy. And anarchy isn't, isn't confusion and craziness. It's no rulers. It's not even mm -hmm. no rule. Uh, anar anarchical uh, uh, organizations can have rules, uh, pretty, mm -hmm. pretty strict rules uh, that everybody should obey. Uh, mm -hmm. And I'm sure that uh, in uh, an anarchical organization, we lived, we lived in a community of, uh, down here in Ecuador of, uh, of, of indigenous people. <clears throat> lovely people mm -hmm. and if you separate them from the government they were pretty autonomous actually the uh, the police who would do some policing there would allow their justice to, su to, to be superimposed before the criminal justice system so they were pretty much on their own and they would have people like I can remember there was the president of the water was one of the positions now this guy I think he was 19 years old no authority at all he was just doing what everybody needed him to do to help them all get hooked up and get clean water. No authority. Mm -hmm. So they all functioned together and they would help him do whatever he needed to do. They would, I, I, I know it's not a pure example, but it's the closest mm -hmm. thing to an example of a community that I've seen. Now, mm -hmm. If a psychopath was born in that community, he would betray himself or she would betray themselves right away. And I'm mm -hmm. sure the community would focus on correcting that psychopathic behavior. I can remember, mm. I can remember one time they, uh, in the community that we lived in, they, uh, there was a woman and her son who were uh, stealing cows. And uh, they caught the woman and her son. And uh, their punishment for her was uh, they gave her lashes with this particular, oh, weed. I mean, it's, it's Medieval punishment, yeah, medieval punishment. And then they turned her over to the local officials to be tried. But the, but the son, who was 18 years old, they wouldn't turn him over to the authorities. They wanted to work with him more. So I think in these indigenous communities, they would work with the psychopath, but there would be no power source for the psychopath. He, would be, mm. he wouldn't be an outliner. He would have to go go or, or they would, honestly, they would destroy him or her. Mm -hmm. So uh, it's, there's no psychopath magnet. There's no government. There's no corporation. There's, it, it can stay flat. It can stay harmonious. Now mm -hmm. we, have, we have psychopaths that are breeding parapsychopaths, that are creating psychopathic uh, uh, societies that 
think that it's, if you have a great new car, no, it doesn't matter how you get that car. You know, I, I'm in service to whoever will pay me most. I can remember uh, there, was a, there was a contest. Um, who would sell their soul to the devil if they could have fame and fortune? Well, they had people falling over themselves to enter that contest. So we have, a, we have kind of a psychopathic society created mm -hmm. by these psychopathic organizations who, who give us our, our rules and roles through programming, through TV. They tell us what's right and wrong. Uh, they're teaching us to be transsexuals. I mean, it's, it's really getting, uh, getting horrible because we have these psychopath magnets that allow them to control us and we have to get out. And I think, I think I think that is it. And I think, you know what, this is precisely what's going to save us in a sense. We we have to get out, I think. This is it, you know. If you really want to save the planet, we have to get out because as we're speaking, all the things you mentioned are going on, you know, the child trafficking, the drug running, which are almost as horrible as they are, they always seem to be just essentially parts of a much bigger structure, you know. They are just feeding into essentially crippling entire communities with the drugs getting more money out of them, making everybody just, yeah, like un dysfunctional in a sense, families dysfunctional, then stripping the children from those families, using the child abuse to brainwash people, to get control files on the, on the ruling, you know, elites and so on and so on. It's just an endless cycle of never ending crime and psychopathology. Right. And, and to me, it seems almost like what we're dealing with is um, that entire setup was incredibly successful for conquering other countries, you know? They would just go in to bring in the drugs. I mean, now we have the, the uh, president of the Philippines, for example, who's, who's fighting drugs, you know, as, as hard as he can, because I think he knows as soon as they are going to set foot in that country, it will be destroyed, you know? It will be gutted from the inside and it will bring all the other horrible stuff um, with it. Um, so he has got this war on, on uh, drugs going on, you know. Right. And, um, but I think what we're dealing with is essentially legacy systems. You know, as you said, this, this pyramid organization has been with us for thousands of years. Right. And, and now it has reached the stage whereby it's wreaking havoc on a global scale. So there's nowhere to go, right. you know. It, I think the pyramid has now conquered the entire planet. So um, by now it's not conquering new, um, new assets, it's destroying its own assets. I right. think that's the, that's the real issue. Um, but then the question is, once you have something that's so entrenched, how do we, how on earth do we get, get to a better world? You know, that's right. I think the real... Well, that's something that we're, that we're all going to find our way through this. I, I, think that, I think they're a house of cards. I think they're going to come down quite easily as soon as we find which cards to pull mm. out. And I think, using my fish and water analogy again, we have to see our enemy. And I think this is the first foray into seeing our enemy. Yeah, we can notice it's governments, but it's not just governments. It's the pyramid. Mm. And mm. as long as we allow ourselves to be slaves to the pyramid, and that's what we are. Uh, you're slave to the pyramid. You'll do what they tell you or there'll be violence. Yeah. Uh, that's, that's just the way it is. We need to get out from the pyramid. And also, I think that we really should be thinking in terms of um, how we can start undoing some of the things that they're doing using our basic team structure because we're going that's to that's a good idea so essentially this is almost like repair units you know it's a repair unit yeah yeah and, and people let's say you have six or seven people get together i think i don't think they need to be local i think uh, you mm -hmm. can form over the internet you can form uh, different groups of ti's i think the ti's should definitely be watching one another's back i think there should be mm -hmm. a ti team uh, local TI teams, international TI teams, studying everything they do, knowing everything they do, and identifying the key players and trying to find out who they report to. Remember, mm -hmm. uh, they're, they're a, uh, if they're functioning autonomously at all, they're an, an, an anathema 
to the structure that they report to. So they're, mm. they're, they're basically working against the organization that's working with them. So there's got to mm. be a way to drive um, or think of ways to separate that out. Also, I think that uh, doing things that are uh, inconsistent with natural law but may not be consistent with man's law are in order. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> Do you have an example for that? What do you mean by that? Well, now this is going to be way off the scale and I'm not advocating violence, but if we could find someone who's stalking you, someone who's stalking several people, because they will be stalking several people, and we could uh, somehow interfere with their ability to do that physically, uh, I think that would be in, in, in consistent with natural law because we're using force against violence. Mm -hmm. So stopping them doing that, stopping them doing that. Um, and uh, I think we can, I think that the autonomous teams are free to do that. We're free to expose people we're free to take mm. action against people. Well, what? Let's say we did something against someone who was like the guy that was sitting behind you on the plane, shooting you mm. with, with death rays in the back of your head. Let's say we had two other TIs that were able to uh, say pull him aside and mm. uh, convince him that he was not doing the right thing, so to speak. I think yeah. that would be well within. Uh, natural law to try to get him to stop and de desist. Um. Yeah, see, this is exactly it, because I um, when that happened, I mean, this entire action was so demonstrative. I mean, on the flight out, I was microwaved on the back of my head, and then this guy even went through this routine of saying, oh, you know, pain on the back of the head. I mean, in the olden days, I would have been within my right of just turning around and slapping right. him as hard as I can. Right. But here it would count as an assault, and then it's on me to prove that this is really happening. And I, that's essentially how the laws are set up to prevent us from acting naturally. Right. You know, so it's what we have is a psychopathic system. Um, and meanwhile, what we actually do have, and there are many, many examples um, of that, certainly in the child abuse inquiry, but many other um, weird court cases, for example, in the UK, where there's one of, for example, Melanie Shaw, she's a whistleblower in the child abuse um, scandal. She has, I think, even reported murder and, and so really horrible stuff in this topic. And yet she ended up in prison and no one knows for what. And right. she's, she's sentenced to two years in prison. I mean, anybody who has, you know, a, a clear mind knows that this is essentially abuse by a captured system. But how come the judge who sentenced to her is, you know, free to go? Do you right. see what I mean? So what we really need to do is um, bring back personal accountability and all this, you know, exactly. Exactly. because what they also do, these psychopaths, and this is something we haven't talked about at all, is essentially they're using limited liability in these limited liability companies to do whatever they like through their commands down to structure right. and then hide behind the financial buffers, the legal teams and the limited liability of this right. corporation. So it's very, very hard to actually get at their private assets if, if one wants to have damages. You know? Right, right, exactly. Um, and and that's, that's by definition a, a psychopathic structure. And I think what, what we should really move towards is, um, is outlaw that, you know, outlaw automatic psychopathology. I think that's but right. instead, what, what, what happened is that actually we moved in the other direction. For example, I've heard that in Britain, what they used to have is, I think, lawyers were were in partnerships so they were law firms and they were all partners but now they introduced what's called the limited liability partnership and i think that just opens the door to rampant corruption in the legal profession i mean sure. not that you know sure. that we were just waiting for that to see rampant corruption you know but i mean this is this is going to be yet another layer so there before um at least one could get go after the lawyers you know for malpractice for example but with a limited liability partnership, there's nothing stopping a lawyer taking bribes, for example, from a company that you're trying to go up against, right. betray you as a client entirely, and then if you try to sue, hide behind yeah. the limited liability. 
And I think it's these sort of mechanisms that essentially one can already predict will lead to psychopathic outcomes, you know, and horrific crimes. They're put in place by psychopaths. That's all yeah. Idea. If you, well, first of all, I think if you want to fight this, you have to, you can't own stock in a corporation that's mandated to do the best interest in the, in the, of the stockholder. That's a, yeah. You're feeding the psychopathic me mechanism. You have to take your money out of that somewhere else. That, you know, it doesn't matter. Money's going to be money's money is another pyramid that we can talk about another time. But there, mm -hmm. there are things like um, they're going to pass laws that's going to protect their them and their pyramid. That's what they're going to do. You're outside of their pyramid. Um, mm -hmm. You, you, we need to do uh, things outside. We're not. Subject to their law, yeah, they can incarcerate us. They can, they'll, they'll do violence, but we need mm. to be move, we move faster. I can remember uh, there were there was a uh, psychopathic pedophile priest who was molesting children in uh, in Hampstead. Uh, he's still operating today, and what happened was there was a, a team of people who decided to just taunt him and irritate him all the time, keep him from doing that. Finally, uh, they had a restraining order, they had something against him. I wouldn't have let that stop me. I would have gotten around that by some other electronic means. I would not let him molest another child. If I lived in that neighborhood and I had a team, I had a team of 12 people, I would be on his butt from morning to night. I would not allow him. The same with this James Alephantis character. He's free, and he's free. He's one of the 50th, 50 most powerful people in, in Washington. He's got to molest children. You see, they get addicted to what's called adrenochrome. When they, when they torture children, and I'm sure they're getting some type of luge from you when they get you fearful and upset. Well, they get it in the blood of these children. They don't just kill them, they terrify them, and then they kill them. And this creates a substance called adrenochrome, which is incredibly addictive. So James Alephantis, uh, the Podesta brothers, uh, and I'm not going to say this, I don't care whether they're convicted or not, there's enough evidence against them for me to be convinced, and any reasonable person to be convinced, that they're child molesters. I would not allow them to do that. I would be on their ass, I would be with them, I would tell the police, I would know them, I would do everything I could in a team environment. My, my objective would be no more free ride for James Alephantis, no more free ride for John Podesta. Mm -hmm. I know where they are, we're going to follow them. I, you know, there's, it's, it's zero, we zero base everything we can do. Uh, they're going to pass laws that are going to keep us from doing this, pass laws. Mm -hmm. We've got to not subs be subservient to the triangle anymore. We have to do our thing. And we have mm -hmm. to spread the team. We have to spread the community. We have to realize what we're up against. And I, it's, it's, for, it's for us now to figure out how we're going to do this. And, I, and I'm happy to, if you think it's worthwhile, put together a couple uh, presentations on the basics of getting off the pyramid. Um, Absolutely. I really think so, because you know what is happening as we speak, and I see that more and more. I mean, certainly in the, in the, um, in the community of these, these victims, they realize that um, they have to do something. You know, these people just don't stop. Right. They, just, they just keep running. It's, it's a system out of control. They just keep doing it. And um, I think what we really have to do is, is essentially what you're suggesting, you know, self-assemble teams autonomously. And what happened also in the past is that they took the people who could be leaders of this movement and they assassinated them. I mean, there are horrific examples of that. Well, so this time we have something of no leaders, no one's leading. Everybody's doing their thing and right. self-assembling and adding a bit. And for me, it always looks like it looks like a team of volleyball, doesn't it? You've got a team yeah. on one side of the net and on the other, and they just pass the ball, you know? 
bounce it between themselves and then pass it across and then bounce it there and pass it across, right. you know, or maybe to another team. And I think this is how it has to be, you know. And I think we really should start talking about that because, um, in a sense, that's the future, right? That's what will ignite the, the change. Yes. You know, we need yes. a group to put out ideas of how people can do that because everywhere around the world. I mean, you have people who go after the um, the child abuse, so citizen investigations into child abuse. There are people who are trying to find new ways to actually repair the economy and build jobs, right. new ways to have local currencies, for example. And all these are based on essentially self-assembled teams. So I think we really should go, you know, move on to, to actually putting the, the, the previous wisdom out there so that people can see, oh, yes, that's a good idea, you know. Um, just to, to actually prompt them with ideas of this is what really works, you know, this is what has been tried in the past and why don't you, why don't you go down this path? And you know, another thing is also, um, I also discovered that once you give something a name, you know, for example, when I started talking to people about deep capture and that capture right. happens, that deep capture is just a phenomenon, then no one is surprised anymore. No one is incredulous, you know, right. it's, it's tangible. And then they say, oh, of course, you know, it must be that the judiciary is in deep capture. And then immediately you're over this step of, oh, we don't know what is going on. And everybody moves on to the next step of finding out, okay, who are the corrupt ones, right. you know? Exactly. And that's, that's just the power of images, the power of having a name for something. And, and I think when we start talking about these autonomous teams, People, real, people will move out of this, oh, we don't know what to do situation. Right. And they will move on to, oh, this is how we're going to do it from now on right. stage, you know? Right. So we move from this, this nebulous situation of just despairing about the things we have, and we start talking about what do we want instead, and right. let's start building it. I think this is what we need. Exactly. I think that would, be, that would be really, really good, because the world needs to know, you know? Well, good. Well, we and in a, sense, in a sense, I think people are, are trying it already, but it's, they don't have a, an actual term in their mind that, oh, this is what we're doing, you know? Right. They're trying a little bit here, they're all searching on Google and talking to people, but they never think, hang on, what we're doing is we're essentially repairing society using autonomous teams, right. you know, decentralized right. autonomous teams. Right. There's, there's so many, well, we're, we're, the first on the, we're the first team starting this, you and I. And I'm sure Eric will want to help, and I'm sure there's, there are other TIs listening to this. Oh, really absolutely. I, and it, it reminds me of, uh, I was interviewing Oli Damagard, I don't know who that is. He's, and Oli was explaining that when they do pull the false flags now, they try not to kill people. Like in uh, Sandy Hook, nobody died. You know, there's, they try not to kill people because they found that the mothers don't let go. The mothers mm -hmm. hold on, what's happened to my child, I want to know. And I'd like to see the mothers of these kidnapped children not let yeah. go. Don't rest back. Get in touch with other mothers on social media. Let's form teams. Let's do something about mm -hmm. it so that no other kid gets kidnapped. Let's, yeah. Even if it's just in your community, whatever you can do. If you've lost a child, um, Get together with other mothers. Let's find out what's going on. I can, I can, I know, I know uh, uh, mothers that we've worked with uh, that uh, could could organize and get into this. Get into the CPS. Find out what's going on in child protective services because they're corrupt to the core. They have they yeah. have quotas. They, the elites, the psychopath at the top, gives them quotas to abduct your children. You don't need to put up with that. You're not part yeah. of that organization. You're going to do the right thing. And we can do it through self-organizing teams that are created. I agree. I agree. And also, I think we need to, um, you know, because what they're doing with the TI is they're essentially hunting them and torturing them, you know. Yeah. And I don't advocate for torturing anybody, but I, I do advocate for hunting people down within the administration as and finding them and removing them, you yes. know, removing them and, and putting them in jail, essentially. Right. But for that, we need to identify who they are. And I am entirely, you know, I, my, my grandfather um, used to go on hunts. And, you know, when I was a child, he said, when you're really scared and you feel like you're being hunted, become the hunter, you know, yeah. 
you move from being just a prey to a predatory uh, mindset. And I think this is what we have to do, you know. And we have to ask ourselves at what point will we say enough of this and will actually rise and actually start hunting people down? You know, who, who were they? Because, for example, the citizen investigation into pedophilia was just that, and it did produce criminal convictions in large numbers, as I understand, you know. People just networking, people finding this out. Um, and I think this is what we have to do, really. We have to find out who, who in the organization is stopping TIs from getting right. justice, where the corrupt police of it, um, officials. And, um, and when we look at just the scale of the criminality, you know, how much these people found out about the kidnapped children themselves, you know, in the Hampstead cover-up, you know, finding out the actual rat lines, you know, of, right. of child trafficking and so on. If private citizens can do that, at some point, we need to wake up to the fact that if private citizens can do that, the, uh, the, the intelligence agencies could do that by midday. Right. So why are they not stopping it? Well, they aren't. Yeah, they aren't. They aren't because I, I personally believe they are organizing it. I think they, they are there to organize it. But, but at some point, we have to say, hang on a second, they are still, to this date, still government organizations, not autonomous crime syndicates. So... Um, you know, and, and this is, I think, what we have to start doing and say, well, whichever chief of intelligence doesn't stop this is essentially in on it. He must be. Okay. You know, there's no way for him not to know what's going on. Right. Well, they, um, I can remember I did uh, a talk about uh, CIA's torture program. Yeah. And it's crimes against humanity. And every law enforcement organization in the United States I know is obligated to um, prosecute crimes against humanity. None, yeah. of, none of them have stepped up. So we have to do it in autonomous teams. Now, the yeah. autonomous teams can include sheriffs, they can include concer and concerned citizens of all kinds, and the sheriffs are going to think of ways. I mean, we look, we've got people who were inside that organization, and, and as soon as you see it as evil, it's the course of the problem, then you can turn around and start solutions. You know, I was a sheriff for 20 years, and here's how we operated, here's how we worked. If we want to stop this, we need to intervene at this point, we need to get this person. And, you know, I'm not advocating criminality as such, but mm. their laws are going to protect the triangle. Their laws are going to protect the pyramid. And the pyramid mm. is anti-human. You got to see the pyramid as anti-human. It's suppressing our natural. I think that we're at the stage of human development, and I can see it. I can, I can see it happening. Mm. We're we're in an inversion period where we're learning yeah. from our inversion, and we have to come out of it. Now, does Jesus play a role in this? I you know I don't know, but I know we need to come out of it, and I know mm. that one way to come out of it is to get rid of the matrix yeah. that keeps it on us. And that's yeah. trying to get out from under, and not trying to, we'll be able to get out from under it. We're out from under it. The minute we see it for what it is, we're out from, from under it. And we can use self-organizing teams, individual action and self-organizing teams. And I will put together some uh, basic rudimentary organizations so that we can put those on the internet and have it for. See, that would be fantastic because, in a sense, we, if you could do that, we could we could actually even try them out as a blueprint, you know. We can, we can, and then see how it how they work in practice, and actually report on that, you know, week by week. Because the way I was trying to, um, what I'm start I started doing is that everything I do about trying to help my own situation and that of others, I just put it out online. Right. So that people can, can copy it, people can see why I'm up to, people can see why I run into walls, right. you know. And I think this is, this is probably the, the way, you know, to the future, to have these self-organizing teams and use the internet to communicate with teams that you might not even interact with directly for some right. time. If we could, I, I would advise not to do Facebook, Facebook or Twitter or any of the popular ones. Try to do mm. more obscure, more private... Uh, Social mechanisms. I, I know. Yeah. We, we use Steemit, and there's some other coming up, but they're gonna. They certainly will be uh, as soon as we put this online. They'll soon. 
few I've noticed that we're working in this direction. And, but you can organize yourself. As long as we have the internet, we can organize ourselves across lines. Uh, we also should have local, um, local teams mm -hmm. doing things to, uh, to stop certain things. And it's, uh, when, when we realize that uh, the oppressive force, the matrix, is the triangle, then we can start moving around it and get, get the work done. I think, you know, the, the other thing that occurred to me is that in the, as you said, in the, in the pyramid, it, it all is based on violence and coercion. You know, whereas here, everybody runs on their own motivation. Right. So, in a sense, you're doing more work here out of your self-drive than yeah. you can ever get out of this organization, yeah. ever. And, and look at what you can accomplish. Look, can you imagine... Uh, Stopping child trafficking, bringing a hundred of them to justice, or uh, ruining their mechanism for this uh, gang stalking. Yeah. Uh, I think that well, I think there's a big uh, things we can accomplish, little piece by little piece, and we've got a lot of teams. I mean, we've got an yeah. infinite number of teams. Uh, and we actually have yeah. tough people as well, you know. Yeah, and we can, and there are people that are in these organizations that aren't psychopaths. Yeah. That uh, can can be on organized teams also, and be working uh, to free us from these organizations. But I think people really need to think it through, uh, because mm -hmm. they're used to this organization. I mean, when you go to school, there's a principal and a teacher, and then, I mean, you're you're indoctrinated into this hierarchy from the jump. Mm. It's, it's their system. Mm. It's their system. So we have to realize that we're much more powerful without them, with one another. Um, Absolutely. So we need to go forward. Thank I, we will go forward. Thank you. Thank you very much, Paul. This is, this is something very, very special. I think we're at the, at the start of some, a new era, really. Good. I hope this that would be a paradigm good. change, and and you you help us shape it. Thank you. That's such an honor. Thank you very very much. Well, thank you. Let's stay in touch, and as I work through putting these things together, let's have continue conversations and uh, and we'll keep do that. going with this. Take thank care. you very much. <laughs>